He's the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, Holy Counselor. Da 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 da. Well, I was thinking of that song, and I tried to look it up. It's a Pentecostal song. It's a oneness Pentecostal song, <clears throat> and um, just the revelation of who Jesus is. I know I was listening the other day. Welcome back, saints and seekers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was listening to a young man the other day. He was like, um, yeah, to be quite honest, I, I can't figure out how Jesus is the Son of God and God. I'm still working on these things. And, you know, it's revelation who the Lord is. And we don't know all the mysteries. We're not going to fully understand all about all the mystery of God and the Godhead until we see the Lord. But we have... We see through a glass darkly is what the scripture says. And um, I was reading in, um, he had come to Isaiah 9, verses 6. And uh, that was helping him. And it's one that uh, helps me see it, as well as the first book of John, seeing the deity of the Lord more and more. And as we're studying Matthew, we're seeing uh, Jesus revealing himself to his disciples. He's letting them come to an understanding from the scriptures they already have, the Old Testament. They have that, all those prophecies of him. So those signs are before them, and his disciples are recognizing those signs now. We'll see that in Matthew 16, how the Holy Ghost is revealing to Peter even who Jesus is that he is indeed the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel that has been prophesied. He is now among them. Well, I do want to read, before we go to Matthew 16, let's read Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. <clears throat> Praise God. So that's just a beautiful prophetic scripture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turning over to Matthew chapter 16 now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew 16. So this is where we are in our study. There is so much in this one chapter. Got my little extra light here. I'm struggling with light in my house at the moment. So, uh, Matthew chapter 16. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Okay, what's interesting about this is the Pharisees and Sadducees coming together to come against Jesus shows how much he was threatening both groups. Because these two groups are not friends. They are enemies. You know, one believes in uh, resurrection, another doesn't. One is following some oral traditions, and the other one is sticking strictly. The Sadducees went strictly by the Hebrew Scriptures. So there's all kinds of dissension among these two groups, and yet they come together to challenge Jesus because they are starting to understand who he's trying to be, evidently. And um, they're, they're wanting a sign from him. Verse 2, they desired that verse 1 would show them a sign from heaven. Verse 2, he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. 
O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? And that's just like us. The first coming, they had all these scriptures to discern who Jesus was, and they missed it. They were the blind leading the blind, as Jesus said in a former chapter. But today, we have all this scripture that tells us about the times we are presently living in. And so many people can't see it. Not just unbelievers. There are a lot of Christians that uh, <clears throat> if it's if it's going to shake them up in their life and lifestyle, they don't want to see it. But we have to, if we're serving the Lord and we are concerned about our eternal souls, we want to be in heaven with Jesus. We must wake up. We must be aware of what the scriptures say about these end times. And instead of denying it, <clears throat> kind of that normalcy bias, no, we're kind of comfortable with where we are and we're just going to stay here. You know, you love the world or you love the Lord. And if you love the Lord, you're, you're seeing the signs of the times and you're hungry to know about him and what he has said and to believe what he has said. Verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. So the sign of the prophet Jonas, Jonah was called to go uh, <coughs> preach to Nineveh. They were a wicked people. Jonah didn't want to do it. He tried to diso. They, the Lord, escape, get on a ship, go a different direction. The Lord let him get cast into the sea, into the belly of a whale. Three days he was in the belly of a whale. Then he was spit up onto the shore. Then he went and preached what he had been assigned to preach to the people of Nineveh, and they repented. Their judgment was delayed for a time. God had spoken judgment over them. It was going to come to pass, but it was delayed when they repented. So, we need to obey the first time around when the Lord asks us to do something. Souls are dependent on being saved. Well, verse 5 says, And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. <coughs> And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets he took up how is it that ye do not understand that i spake it not to you concerning bread that ye should beware of the leaven of the pharisees and of the sadducees and at that time the people did understand the word leaven was like false doctrines and teachings <clears throat> it was considered sin leaven was sin so he is cautioning them about the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that there are false teachings and ideologies among them. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the le le leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, Jesus knows who he is. He doesn't need them to confirm who he is, but he's seeing where they are in their understanding of who he is here. So they begin to share what people are saying about him. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now, anyone that knew Jesus personally would know wouldn't be saying that would they so this is hearsay of people they think maybe he's the reincarnation of John the Baptist because they're hearing he's a prophet <coughs> so 
some Elias. Well, Elijah did many, many miracles. So some are thinking it's Elijah come back again in him. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Because Jesus is coming strongly with strong words as a prophet. Uh, he's knowledgeable of the scriptures. He is the living word. And he's doing all these miracles. So people are speculating who this is. Until John the Baptist, they hadn't had a prophet for 400 years that they had heard. So John the Baptist coming on the scene, Jesus coming on the scene. Uh, there's a lot of stirring of excitement around the parts for what's going on here now. Verse 15, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So <clears throat> Peter's got it right. 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give... Oh, let's stop right there. Let's just talk about what we've got so far here. Okay. Jesus is saying, Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And that's how revelation comes to all of us. There's other scripture that says uh, you can't even know who Jesus is except by the Holy Ghost. So we all need revelation to understand this. You know, <clears throat> as, as you grow in the Word, you're getting revelation. But the reason that we really need to seek to be baptized with the Holy Ghost is the Bible tells us when the Spirit of truth is come, He will lead you into all truth. So the Holy Ghost, uh, we need the Spirit of God leading us, ordering our steps, speaking to us. As we're reading the Word, the Spirit is giving revelation of things and quickening things to our spirit. It's kind of like he, he stamps it down into us. We know that we know that we know now when we get that revelation. So uh, we want to know who Jesus is we want to know and understand him better, and we study that word to get that revelation. We spend time in prayer, and revelation comes. So he's now said to him, Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you look that up in commentaries, um, you know, the more I've studied the more revelation I've got. You know, that rock is the understanding. It sounds like Peter is the rock here almost, but the rock is Christ Jesus. And he's just saying this after Peter has had the revelation that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. So what is the church built on? Well, later Peter says, and Peter's name means stone, but later, Peter says that Jesus is the cornerstone of what <clears throat> he is the foundation of the church. You know, nothing's going to work unless you build on a proper foundation. And so you've got to understand that Jesus is the head of the church. He is the chief cornerstone. Peter and these apostles and you and I, we are referenced as lively stones so this is interesting but i believe that that rock is christ jesus the revelation of who he is verse 19 and he's still speaking to peter and i will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven so the Pharisees and Sadducees, familiar with this, they uh, would allow or disallow things of the law. So, um, like when Jesus was 
going through the cornfield on the Sabbath day. They were loose to gather that corn on the Sabbath day. That, uh, you know, when we bind something, we're saying it's not permitted. So if we're um, being under attack of the enemy, we need to bind spirits. What we're doing when we say we bind a spirit in Jesus' name, we're not allowing that spirit entry around us, into us, etc. If we lose something, we're freeing you of something. So, not bound by something. So, we are loosed from certain restrictions as Christians. As they were teaching the Christian way of life, the New Testament, they were being loosed from some law restrictions. They weren't, uh, the Gentiles weren't taught to do all of the Jewish law. And Jesus is um, saying that everything the Pharisees and Sadducees taught, he's saying beware of that leaven so their doctrine is not correct. That's not saying the Old Testament is not correct. But the Pharisees had added a lot of tradition of men to things. And the Sadducees were with, even though they were holding to the Hebrew Scriptures, they didn't understand the resurrection. <clears throat> so Jesus has come. He's teaching these things. He's giving revelation to us. Verse 20, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Because if they go forth and tell that right now, uh, he's going to have lots of problems before his scheduled time to climb on that cross and die for our sins. Verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That's not exactly what they were wanting to hear. They were hoping he was establishing his kingdom. They were going to get out from under all this forced rule of men on the earth. So it's not going, going the way they had planned mentally. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, <laughs> saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So Peter is just wanting his Lord to be A-OK -okay here on earth. He doesn't have the big picture yet. Jesus fully understands what he's here to do, and he's obeying to do so, that you and I might go free. Verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. <clears throat> for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, there's a good question. Two questions for us today. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And we can look at very powerful, wealthy people in the world today. It's all about what they can achieve here. They are Hungry power grabbers. That's all they can think of. But they need to hear what does it, that profit you? If you lose your own soul, that you've gained all these riches and things here on earth, you think you have people esteeming you highly here on earth, but what will that profit you in the light of eternity? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
Well, we have to give whatever the Lord requires of us. He requires our heart. Jesus needs your heart. God wants you to serve him with joy. Serve him with joy. Honor him as he deserves to be honored. Verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So there is a payday coming. It's a good payday for the righteous. It's an evil payday for the wicked. You will be rewarded. There will be recompense. And uh, those that have called on the name of Jesus and have clung to him and been faithful and not given up, they've had patient endurance till the end, they will receive a great reward for their honor and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And we know in the next chapter there's a transfiguration of Jesus where he meets with Moses and Elijah, and several of his disciples witness that. So that is that glory, that time of glory that they witnessed before their death. Well, I love you. Jesus loves you more. What is the smart thing to do today? Well, if you're a child of God, it's to remember to praise him, to worship him, to seek him in his word, to be kind to others, to take time to communicate to others, use those text messages for good, to spread love, a worship song, a word of encouragement to your loved ones, pray without ceasing now for those that are lost, because uh much destruction is going to come to this world and soon we see that how it's gathering up to happen as the word of God said it would and uh, very rapidly so what is our best plan is to be hidden in the Lord Psalm 91 you might want to read that again and just understand how protected you are when you are a child of God the Lord loves us so much. This is way longer than I want my videos to be. Who knows when this will post. Well, but this this is such a rich chapter. Please reread it. Uh, look up commentaries yourself. It would be good to uh, read commentaries on chapter 16. How much background it gives you on the Pharisees and Sadducees. The leanings of this day. It even talks about uh, you know, when Jesus is going to Caesarea Philippi to teach how much pagan worship there is around it. And it's just almost like Jesus set himself right in the midst of that illustrating. If we under we don't understand everything that was going on there at the time, but he's Lord over all. He is the great God and King, and um, he wasn't intimidated by Baal or Pan being born there or all these little things people had come up with for religious reasons. And uh, he knew who he was. He was God in the flesh come to save us from our sins. Well, Acts 2.38, if you need to be saved, that also shows those keys that Peter was given. He said he gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. Peter tells you in Acts 2, 38 and 39 how to receive the Lord. And later it is Peter that goes to the first Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 to Cornelius and reveals to them. He opens the door of heaven for them as well. Jesus is the key. Jesus is that door. I love you. Jesus loves you more. Be blessed.